It's important when you do a time travel story to not cheat, you know, to not just say, well, we can do anything because we're traveling in time. That's no fun because it's just too open-ended. But if you can find specific things that you can go back and change and that's going to have a cascading effect through the rest of the story, that can be tremendous fun. We didn't want to build an idea where you're teleporting back and forth and making time travel this big gimmick. It was really more of a vehicle to us to just get us to this place where we wanted to tell our story. Before what we knew as this shattered realm called Outland, there was this world called Draenor. It was this wild, primeval landscape populated by all manner of creatures, including, of course, the, the brown orcs of Draenor. We originally were thinking about this as a council of the clans, where you would have um, the different orc clans meet to elect their first war chief. They would be forced to make a choice about, you know, which way they were going to go. Would they side with these demon lords or would they go their own way? And then this mysterious cloaked figure would arrive and he would punch out Blackhand and he would maybe choke out Gul'dan and, and throw up the cloak and reveal himself to be Garrosh, this amazing orc from the future. And we were thinking, well, that's cool, but couldn't we be more expansive? Couldn't we find a way to make this bigger break out? We kind of moved in completely away from the direction of where we were and reapproached it with this idea of being upon the throne of Kil'jaeden. All the clans were being brought here to basically give fealty to Gul'dan's poison. So Gul'dan is able to get the different horde leaders to uh, drink the blood of the demons, right? And that way they would become what was known as the horde. They were deceived by the Burning Legion when they made that blood pact, which turned their skin green and their eyes red. You know, if only they had known, right, what uh, the, the blood of Manoroth would actually do to them. But actually, somebody does know. Garrosh, the war criminal, the outcast, who hates all the races of Azeroth and wishes in his darkest of hearts that things had gone very differently and that the orcs of Draenor had followed a different path. Knowing what you know now, you know, how would you go back and do things differently? And how would you kind of help steer history in a different direction? So, so the opportunity to kind of go back to this time and this place where their whole destiny, the whole destiny of their culture is really at this fulcrum point, um, felt really, really good to us as storytellers. Um, it, it felt like it cut right to the roots um, of what the Warcraft franchise has been all about. You will all be conquerors. And what good must we give in return? Everything. Gul'dan is a guy that will go to any length um, and sacrifice anyone around him um, to gain power. It's not about hating other people. It's not about, uh, you know, some civilization or some other person had done him wrong. It's all just stepping stones to attain power and just ascend out of this doldrum existence, I'm sure, that he sees it as. So Garrosh was an orc that was raised in, in Outland. And so he's heard the history of the orcs and he's heard what's happened, you know, to the to all of his people. I think from a very early age, this started to boil in him, this resentment of the Legion and this feeling that things should have been different. I think he started to see that the complexities of the modern horde, right, with all these different races, and trolls and tauren and goblins and things like that, he just, he just didn't get it. I don't get it, the horde, I grew up with all these stories about orcs. It's about orcish identity, it's about orcish dominance, right? Isn't, isn't that who we are? I think it's probably when Garrosh is sitting in that jail cell in manacles awaiting his sentence that this starts to boil up in him. Again, this resentment for the way things turned out for the orcs on Azeroth. And couldn't things be different? I believe that when he went to the past and he was able to make contact with certain of these old chieftains, he fell deeply in love again with this sense of like the orcish ideal. Gromash Hellscream being his father was certainly an easy target for Garrosh to, to be able to appeal to. And his father was this hugely important character in the early days of the Horde. So not a lot is known really about how Garrosh went about contacting Gromash and exactly what he said to Gromash to change his mind and you know get him to lead him down the path. And it's really going to be interesting for players to, as they adventure through Draenor, kind of uncover what happened and uncover what's happened as a result of this change in traditional history. Drink, Hellstream. We started thinking about Manoroth 
And, you know, in the literature, he isn't present at this ceremony, at this blood pact. But we started thinking, that doesn't mean that he wasn't there. Maybe he's, like, using fell magic to cloak himself, to, to hide himself. And so then the Hell Scream's plan started to emerge, that maybe what they needed to do uh, was to openly defy uh, Gul'dan and Manoroth by pouring out the blood, by not drinking from the cup, and make the demon show himself, and then take that guy down. We felt like that the, the sort of whimsical design approach that worked so well for Pandaria probably was the wrong fit for this one. And this one, we needed to go photo real. We just really needed to make you believe as much as possible that you were looking at real creatures. And that comes, you know, at a price. I mean, it is extremely intensive to get in there and really make skin look like real skin and sweat look like real sweat. The thing about CG is you can run into the uncanny valley very quickly, right? But I think what we call hyper-realism is something that our fans really enjoy. You know, we don't use a lot of motion capture, if at all, any. And I think a lot of that is really to create a sense of fantasy. So another big challenge uh, for us was Hellscream and things uh, that have changed from his first inception to this particular rendition of him was he's brown, right? We've only seen him with green skin. When we revisited him here, we knew that this was going to be before he had been corrupted. And so, you know, uh, you know, talking to Chris Metzen, talking to Robinson, a lot of the ideas that were floating around the table is like, these guys are more um, Mongolian, a little bit more feral, more furs, a little bit more of the Conan sort of vibe. We kind of abandoned the old orc and brought out the new and started focusing on what would this a lot grittier, a lot more tangible orc look like. And that's where we landed in. Um, is definitely by far the most scary orc we've ever done in cinematics. The three orcs really needed to be very distinct, especially Gromash and Garrosh. You know, you needed to really understand that they were different characters, but also little hints in there of the lineage because they are father and son, whether they know it or not at this point. I especially like some of the parts of Gul'dan's face. We spent a lot of time with his upper lip, really focusing on like how much the demon blood has really changed him over time. Some of these characters are from the past, certainly, but we needed to re-envision them in a way that they could emote and really convey real action and real um, depth to their characters. So we had to break down their face from a completely different standpoint. So that was the balance, was to make them recognizable, but also to bring them uh, you know, up to speed in terms of 21st century CG. With Manoroth, uh, maybe more so than some of the other characters, we had to walk a very fine line between um, up creating his design with today's tools while still living up to the essence of what Manoroth is and make, keeping him recognizable. There's a lot of things we probably could have updated from a, from a design standpoint, but in, in many ways we had to respect uh, the Manoroth and what people remember him to be. When you look at the two characters, they're obviously you know, mirror images of each other, but with subtle changes enough to where the fan who's really paying attention will notice the huge difference. And did you bring these mongrels here just to watch you die? The point that Garrosh concludes is he's got to stop Gul'dan, and that this curse will not happen, and that the orcs will not turn green, they will not gain super strength and resiliency, they will not become effectively Hulk-like monsters. He's got to give them an edge. Garrosh brings back this concept of a siege engine. Um, it seemed very natural for him to bring these present-day ideas into the past um, to augment um, the Iron Horde as he sees it um, and account for the lack of, you know, physical strength that they would have had um, if they had drank the blood of Manoroth. And as the expansion continues, that concept of the siege engine will start making its way into all of their weapons until, you know, it is sort of the, the heart of their uh, weapons technology. And then from that conceptual platform, really looking at Gromash, right? You know, which way will he go? You know, is there a noble heart in there? And he could be a great hero and a great leader of his people? Or is there just something broken in these Hellscream guys that when pressed, you know, become monstrous with or without demon blood flowing in their veins?
When you're developing a story, there's always a lot of ideas that uh, don't get used. Like, for example, we really thought for a long time that it was very important for Gul'dan to be seen drinking the potion and to see his skin turning green. Cut to his hand slamming the cup down, his hand is shaking with strain as his fingers turn from brown to green, and this fell magic is like roiling off of his hand as he pulls it back. He pulls it up to just you know, revel in the power that he's been given, and we cut in a close-up of his eye just flares red. And it's just funny how it's not until you try it editorially till you cut that out and you go, huh, no, actually, I don't need it at all. I think some of the more uh, loyal fans, if they knew only what got cut, they'd be like, why? We cut to a dagger slicing through skin, and the big drum is sliced right open, and out comes Ballista Jr. Boom, <laughs> right? Boom, boom, firing chain shot. The chains hurtle through the air. They stab the wall behind Manoroth, chaining him to the wall. Uh, one of the ideas that we had was behind him, um, rising from the cliffs, is Zeppelins. And on the deck of the Zeppelins is, you know, the goblin captain, and it's sort of like hovering above Manoroth. And what they're doing is firing chain harpoons into him. Um, he's getting pinned, but he's grabbing the chains and pulling down the Zeppelins. They're going up in smoke. No matter how much we want to tell the 60-minute long version of it, at the end of the day, it's got to fit in about four minutes. You know, sometimes you say, well, I can't use it, but it was still a good idea. The demon pulls back, roars, reels back. <laughs> blast of light coming out of his head. Uh-oh, it looks like history's gonna repeat itself. One of the ideas that sprung up from our early story discussions with our storyboard artists and, and Taryn and myself um, was the idea of doing an homage to the original Warcraft 3 movie. This is an opportunity to do something really interesting from a time travel perspective. We thought, well, how exciting would it be if we literally staged the shot the way it went down the first time, right? So that people who are familiar with the Warcraft cinematic look at it and go, oh my God, it's the same composition, it's the same moment. History is going to repeat itself, but not this time. Without words, uh, without narration, the visual storytelling um, just really um, said it all, um, exactly what is happening, that history has changed. <clears throat> this was not our destiny. Times change. This was actually challenging, you know, because compared to other projects, this is a little tighter in the schedule. It took almost 12 months from beginning to the end so we have to uh, come out with a little bit uh, creative uh, about the scheduling. We had four hero characters. We had a host of background characters. We had a very expansive environment. We had a lot of effects. We had a lot of explosions. We had the blood. And also, we didn't have a full, uh, solid concept at the beginning. So we have to ask modeling team to do sort of 3D concepting. Warlords of Drainer has a couple of really good effects. We wanted to spend some time on small effects this time, but make them very, very detailed. Essentially, we, we always begin uh, from the, the animatics, trying to figure out the, the overall destruction uh, that they're interested in. Uh, usually this sort of thing has a very specific kind of cadence and timing, kind of hitting the beats, and the sort of things that if this was practical, you'd have a whole army of folks figuring out uh, charges and when to detonate things. We pretty much do the exact same thing, only digitally. What we used for reference for these uh, actually was uh, Monty Python's uh, Flying Circus, where they're doing the bit with uh, how not to be seen, you know? You see a bush there, and then it goes off in a fireball. This is the, just happened to be on my mind at the time. For the fire that's on the ground, we actually looked at a lot of reference and for the scale of the fires that we wanted, because fire looks very different at different scales and at different times of day and at different exposure settings for the camera. So actually what we did was we looked at um, cars that were on fire, shot at night, because it was about the right scale, about the right speed, and it had about the right camera exposure. One of my favorite effects was the plasma blast. We did tons of different concepts for this. We did versions that were smokier and versions that were fierier. That was a lot of fun, because we had never seen a demon plasma blast before, so we got to sort of concept it all from the start. There's the blood 
of Manoroth. We had a very close-up shot of that. We wanted to make sure that you understood that this was something evil. To create the believable blood, again, I think it's, it's a couple things. One is getting the simulation such that it is giving you that full three-dimensional motion, which gives the right viscosity and the right shapes, either uh, as something is being poured or is dripping. Uh, and then the second thing is uh, having it uh, smear and adhere onto a surface, which, again, we I did kind of a, a hybrid technique where one set of simulation techniques for flowing blood and the other for anything that's adhering to the surface and dripping on it. Also, we film a lot of reference in order to get an idea for how we'll do the acting. Making these movies is a lot of sitting in front of computers, so uh, we try to make things analog whenever we can, and it's a great way to generate ideas because it's very fast, it's very cheap, and we're not worrying about lighting or, or the look of anything. It's all just about performance and character and story. <laughs> One of the differences between uh, Miss Pandera and, and uh, Warlords is that we changed our tech for what we were using for hairs. Before, for instance, on the panda, we almost had individual hairs that were sculpted by an artist, like to the level where maybe every 12 hairs were basically controlled as individual pieces. So it was just kind of untenable, and the size of our files were huge and blew up because we, we didn't have a nice procedural. So then when we switched to X-Gen, they basically sculpt one hair, and that account for a few hundred. We have spent more time on this show thinking about how characters in the show flex and show off the way that they're moving, especially with Gramash, who has to be this strong leader. So we spent probably about six weeks developing all the different muscle groups, from biceps to triceps to pec muscles, even down into his neck tendons as they fire off in different parts. Altogether, I think we have almost 200 maps that are dedicated to firing off muscles on different parts of his body. The biggest challenges for us were it diving into these characters and truly digging out these smaller features, making sure that all of those muscles are firing in symphony, that you understood exactly what the character was feeling before he even says it. And it was a huge undertaking between animation and, and prod tech, our rigging team and our R&D department to put together this new face rig. And I think it really shows we're able to do more with the face than we've ever done before. Lighting needs to almost be invisible uh, in ways that it actually carries the story forward, but you don't realize that it's doing it. And a lot like music does, where it can subtly kind of come in and just carry you into a, a mood. For this particular scene, we had an interesting color palette. We have the blue moonlight is pretty dominant, but then you have firelight, right? And blue and the firelight work pretty well together, moonlight and firelight. Um, then you throw in the green light of the blood pools and Manoroth himself. We wanted to avoid in most shots all three because uh, we wanted to just concentrate on two at least in each shot. But we try not to connect lights. So anytime we're lighting a character, we always try to have the core shadow breaking up two of the tones. We don't want two tones touching each other. The large scale environments are the difficult ones because we're so used to seeing uh, things that are uh, in reality outside. So our eye is really quick and our brain really picks up what is fake and what is real. So a lot of elements have to be created to push the realism of it and to get that believability in the shot. And we knew early on that the dark portal had to feel absolutely massive and everything else had to support the, the hero character, which is the dark portal. So everything had to drive that idea. We lit the shot mostly dark and until the portal is revealed, we have that nice dramatic lighting to push the idea of the dark portal. It is very conceivable that if the Iron Horde gets their dark portal finished on Draenor, that they could come through into our Azeroth and really cause us some trouble. Warcraft is just this big moving thing and there's just so many little pockets and nooks and crannies of, of content that can still come forward and be relevant. It's so much fun. It's just such a trip, you know, after all this time to see these ideas being vital. It's just been a pleasure to take this journey uh, back in time to revisit these classic Warcraft characters and situations and also to introduce them to a new generation of players. It brought back a lot of nostalgia for us getting to use these characters again that were really not that much more than just entries in the back of a manual, you know, in, in, in those first Warcraft games and to get to dimensionalize them and their culture and this moment in history has been uh, thrilling. We will never be slaves!
The sound of World of Warcraft has been evolving over the years. With every new expansion, we create new music, we have new dialogue, new sounds, and that helps to tell the story of the game. In the evolution of the sound of World of Warcraft, we always have to make sure that we have a little bit of the DNA that uh, makes it sound like it, the sound actually belongs in the uh, Warcraft universe. On Mists of Pandaria, we had a lot of artistic license to introduce new sounds to the player because it was a new race, new class, new consonant. On Warlords of Draenor, we kind of have the opposite challenge, is that we're revisiting a part of the world that people already know, but in a different time. Shadow Moon in Burning Crusade was a very scary place. We had to make it sound very fearful. Going into the new Shadow Moon, it's exactly the opposite. And this is where players finally get a chance on Draenor to see what the Draenei lived like. So the challenge is how do you make something that's old and everybody knows new and fresh? Over the years, the size and the amount of time that we've had to work on the game has grown, and that uh, allows us to do more things, go out and record animals, bring in actors, and experiment and do a lot of things that, that people didn't have the time or the resources to do early on in the game. We had a great place to start from. From the very beginning, we've had a good concrete foundation that we started with with our original races. So building on that's not so difficult. On Warlords of Drainer, to coincide with the introduction of the new uh, player models, we're adding um, new sounds to help bring those HD visuals sonically up to HD quality as well. And we're doing that in a variety of different ways. One of the things that we did, we went to a Hollywood Foley stage and recorded a whole bunch of footsteps with one of the best Foley artists in the business. For the first time in Warlords of Draenor, we'll actually have footsteps that are unique to certain races in the game. In addition to that, we're also adding new terrain types. So when you're actually exploring the world and you're running from you know, one surface to another, there actually will be a sound change in the game. One of the things that we had to do was make the sound for the Iron Horde. And uh, the great thing about the Iron Horde is, is that they have all this great, awesome machinery you know, that's big and heavy and, and dense and threatening. And obviously it doesn't exist in the real world. So what we had to do is, you know, look for parallels that are in reality that we can actually go out and record. We actually went out to a train museum and recorded railroad couplers, you know, railroad uh, cars moving and hitting each other, you know, brakes, doors, levers, hatches, everything. You know, trying to really kind of capture the sounds of old technology, you know, steam trains, nothing really combustion based. And then I've taken that back, you know, to, to the studio and, you know, using a lot of the plugins and technology that we have to sort of granulize it, manipulate, you know, the sounds, um, make them sound very interesting, you know, just not kind of what you hear is what you get kind of thing, you know, make it very different. Recording all the train source was all the material that made those machines come to life as far as like a tangible sonic footprint. But the threatening and that screaming and the screeching thing, we really didn't get from that. What's something that's really screechy and really abrasive and really threatening and irritating, you know, that, that we could use as a layer to add to that? We just went and bought, you know, dry ice at a local grocery store and, you know, we're rubbing it on different types of metals and seeing what makes a cool sound and what doesn't. You put the train sounds and the dry ice sounds together, and it really brings those machines to life. On the creature side, one of the things that we started to do in Miss Pandaria is actually go out and see the creatures that are in the world, and then actually go out and try to find real life versions of them. On Warlords Draenor, we actually had a whole bunch of wolves that we had for the frost fire. And so what we wanted to do is go out and get our own unique set of wolf sounds that we could actually use in our sound design. <laughs> We recorded about six different wolves, and uh, every wolf had its own personality. When you hear them growl at you and snarl, there's that adrenaline that you feel, you know, that terror. We want the players to experience something similar. And uh, the second component to the animals is to bring on a voice actor uh, to kind of fill in the blanks, you know, play up a lot of the, the wounds, you know, because we can't go around, you know, 
kicking animals, and so we need some of those like more detailed sounds. So Sorted in Stone was an awesome experience. Uh, Tony Swatton was very hospitable. We got to record his awesome forge. A lot of different anvils with different size hammers, you know. You know, Brian, when that thing fired up and was going, that totally reminded me of, like, Goblin. Oh, for so sure. Goblin. Mm -hmm. With Garrison's going in, we wanted to make sure that, you know, since you have these unique trade buildings, that those kind of stand out and have their own unique quality. So when you're walking by a mine, it won't be the same tink, 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 all the time. Now there'll be more variations and hopefully again help uh, better immerse the players into the world. Prior to World of Warcraft's initial release in November of 2004, the sound team made some very precedent-setting choices in, for instance, how the music is created. Even though by 2004, these folks could create what was then state-of-the-art in terms of music that was generated partially with electronics. They still had a sort of an old-fashioned take on how to create memorable melodies. People fell in love with this music. It's still the favorite of so many players and yet not many people realize that there's probably just about two hours or so of music in that original 2004 release. There were some music cues that were used in over 200 separate locations in the game. And we thought we could do better than that. With the release of Mists of Pandaria, we had hit about 52 hours of music in the game. So if you do the math, you'll realize that not only did we evolve the sound palette in the nearly, at that time, eight years since the original 2004 release, we e evolved the amount of music. And we could use the success of WoW as an opportunity to reinvest and not only create more music, but make it of higher quality. You could take the simplest melody of the game, and instead of playing it on a keyboard, if you hear it with a beautiful oboe or English horn or the human voice, it imparts something timeless that will resonate with you at a very basic level. The composing team for Warlords of Draenor have some unique challenges this time around. For instance, the Horde is splintering now. This must be portrayed musically. And now the Horde and Alliance have a common enemy. And to make that all fly, without walls of text and walls of dialogue, music's a great tool for that. And did you bring these mongrels here? Just to watch. I think a lot of people don't realize how hard uh, voice acting is. It's acting with a capital A. That voice actors have to go into a recording booth, you know, with no co-stars, no wardrobe, no prop, no makeup, and get told they're a six-foot green angry orc who's got daddy issues. Step aside, Pandaren. You confront a force beyond reckoning. It's really hard to cast orcs because, first of all, just finding actors who can sustain the orc sound is really challenging. As we all know, the kind of orc sound is very growly and textural, so it really does take a toll on the human voice. And here we go. 
But on top of that, we need to find somebody who can also find depths to their character while growling to kind of find nuances when you're growling and kind of having that uh, orc personality is, is quite challenging. We will never be slaves! For Warlords of Draenor, there's going to be so many orcs, and we're working to make sure it's not just a wall of screaming orcs the whole time. Um, my goal is to find nuances and flavors and particular personality traits for each orc, so ultimately you do care about them and what they're going through. Drink, Hellstream. Claim your destiny. Most of the voices need to sound big and deep, but it's always organic and not processed, which are two different things. Then what, Gul'dan? Must we give in return? Everything. World of Warcraft, um, what's changed the most is, one, we have a much bigger team that is able to contribute. And also, just technology in general, our game has a lot more options. Also, having a larger team, we have a lot of people contributing new ideas, and it makes all of us advance. Every time we touch a new expansion on World of Warcraft, we have an opportunity to, to create something new for the player. New creatures, new races, new environments, new music that help hold all that story together. It's when all these disciplines come together that the world really begins to take shape. The world will come for you. Yes. I'm counting on it. For pretty much as long as we've been developing in-game cutscenes, Garrosh has been right there with us. From his debut in the Patch 3.2 Ulduar trailer, to his grand performance in Siege of Orgrimmar, we've seen him come into his own as a character, as I feel we've been coming into our own as a cinematic division. We're gonna show you how we got here. Back in 2004, uh, I was working alone, doing all the videos for uh, the commercials and things like that for Blizzard. And I had um, a couple ideas on, on improving those commercials and things like that by bringing more characters into them. And the uh, company decided that I would get my first employee, and his name was Brandon Vanderpool. Early on, we tested lots of different prototypes. Why? Why? Oh, please, why? Ah! So back then, we didn't have any real tech. Uh, so what we did is we captured animations in the game, and the animations weren't exactly what we wanted, but I did my best to make them work. We realized that Machinima had certain limitations on what you could do with it, but looking into it, we go, you know what, there's something here, and we really wanted to, to explore it quite a bit more. So we decided that we were going to bring in people that have been doing Machinima out in the real world, and then train them to do Blizzard stuff and see where we go from there. I prefer to remember the temple as it used to be not the abomination it has become. When the Machinima team started at Blizzard, we were only about three people strong, in addition to Joey Ray. And uh, we were primarily tasked with doing gameplay trailers and uh, short films to promote the content. Uh, I was tasked with creating a trailer for the Black Temple patch 2.1, which of course was Illidan, the main story of the Burning Crusade. Up until this time, trailers for patches had been really raid-centric. Uh, but given the backstory of, of what had happened in Warcraft 3 and how everything led up to this moment with Illidan and the Black Temple, and we knew that we could tell more story with this. And they had, of course, questions about the lore. I answered a few questions here and there via email, and then it seemed much better. Joy Ray just suggested, why don't you just come in and just sort of do a story time? I don't think we had one of those sessions go less than two hours and it really helped to build the richness of the pieces that we were working on at the time. It was really exciting and really ambitious um, because we only had the Black Temple in the game. So the team said, what if they could go back in time? I remember the temple as it used to be, a place of worship. I prayed within its chambers and meditated among its gardens. Initially, when people found that we were doing a very narrative version of these trailers, they, they kind of gave us a, an awkward glance, like, really? How are, how are you going to do this with, you know, without, without focusing on the raid? We helped him seal the portals of Outland and cut off the Legion's reinforcements. I think part of me knew, even then, that the Black Temple had only traded one evil master for another. 
The Black Temple trailer was interesting in that it had a very specific story. And it stood alone really well, but it was disjointed to some degree from the game. And so again, it was this, wow, they told a really cool story in this trailer, and I wish we could actually deliver on it in game. Well, maybe there's a way. Kind of riding the coattails of Black Temple, one day, Joey Ray pulls me in the office and says, I have a special project uh, that's been given to us. I'm like, really? He says, here it is. Give me a script, lift it up, the Wrathgate. I think one of the turning points for Mission of Men and Blizzard was the Wrathgate piece. We created this piece that had never been done in a Blizzard game. And it really changed the scope of what the storytelling within the game could be. I was wondering if you'd show up. I couldn't let the Alliance have all the fun today. The idea started kind of sparking as, as we started talking to the Machinima group as to what it is that we could potentially do in an in-game environment. And was there a way to get some really powerful moments through Machinima that we otherwise just couldn't really deliver on to the player through scripted events? I reconvene with my guys and we're talking about, a, do they realize what they just did? <laughs> they gave us a whole movie to go in World of Warcraft. Let's not screw this one up. <laughs> You speak of justice, of cowardice. I will show you the justice of the grave and the true meaning of fear. We knew early on in the production of the Wrathgate that if we were to succeed, we would be able to continue making more movies for the game. And that really drove us to throw everything we had at it. Behold now. The terrible vengeance of the Forsaken! Sylvanas. Death to the Scourge! And death to the Living! I believe the Wrathgate was a good example of taking what was essentially internal machinima as far as it was going to go. Everything moving on screen was being driven by players. We'd actually have giant LAN parties where up to 40 people on the QA staff would all be logged in and we'd be on vent and we'd be, all right, everyone, get together. We're gonna do this shot. And uh, anyone who's done raids before knows what it's like to try to get 40 people to coordinate on screen. Well, imagine if one person jumping blew the shot. Oh, cut, let's take it again. No jumping. Production was very scary. <laughs> We were trying to solve problems as they came up. So we could be in the middle of a shoot, per se, with 30 people because we needed to do an army scene. And then all of a sudden, something would go wrong. A character would disappear. A server would crash. And then we would have to solve it right then and there. But, you know, we thrived under the pressure, and we always got it done on time. You know, if it meant sleeping under our desks and working 12 hours at a time and getting three hours sleep and getting up and doing it again, you know, we always got our shot. Slowly but surely, we started asking for, hey, what if we could get, you know, the ability to maybe separate out our characters? Or, you know, what if we had the ability to force animations? We are going to need all the help we can get if we are wrong. What are they doing here? Let me explain. I thought I smelled the stench of Alliance pigs. The Secrets of Ulduar Patch trailer really brought together a large cast of characters, including Varian Wren, Jaina Proudmoore, Ronan, Thrall, and Garrosh. This would have been the first time Garrosh was really put front and center in a cutscene. Up until this point, he'd just been an NPC that only the Horde players had really interacted with in the Burning Crusade. But this was the moment that he was coming to the forefront and demonstrating that he's going to be an important character moving forward. Hmm. I want to see this dwarf, Garrosh, to see the fear in his eyes. Then we'll know if he's telling the truth. No. No, wait! So our artists got together with Metzen and said, what would you like Garrosh to really look like if we're putting him in front of a camera? And he detailed exactly kind of what he should look like and really zeroed in on the eyes. Uh, the eyes were really the unique thing that made Garrosh stand out, even from that first cutscene. He wanted them to be brown, like many of the Maghar, but really penetrate with kind of a wolf in stare, predator in the dark at all times. And you can see that theme resounding from the very beginning through his many iterations moving forward that it's always that that amber glow 
Without its master's command, the restless scourge will become an even greater threat to this world. There must always be a Lich King. The first piece the Cinemax actually helped on with, uh, with their resources was the fall of the Lich King, where they came in and they brought their animators in, and their animators animated the Lich King, and they animated his dad. Father, is it over? At long last. It really changed the feeling of the, the machinima itself because it really started pulling you in to where you were even more connected. Something that had been long plaguing us in trying to tell such uh, emotional stories was the wooden nature of the faces. And so the one thing we knew we really needed was the ability to make the characters more expressive and really convey uh, the emotions that we were going for. <laughs> And one of the things that we had done historically with uh, big story moments was script them. And we thought, well, maybe we could take the same format of machinima and give you smaller, punchier hits into any number of different story hooks. Uh, the Goblin and the Worgen uh, interstitial pieces being a great example. Is there even a shred of humanity left within you? They were extremely impactful uh, in helping us tell a lot of story in a little bit of time. As we moved forward into the Cataclysm content, all over the place, we, we started to see our effects design leveling up, character animation with the goblins leveling up. We had gotten to the point where we could force animations, we could force effects, but even better than that, we started getting animators in addition to that. So we would animate our, our prime shots, and we would have moving cameras, and we would have all sorts of things that we didn't have before. It was really exciting to see what was machinima starting to become a little bit more animation. And for the first time, not having to use a whole lot of live action. Most of the characters were actually being driven procedurally in ways that we could, didn't have to use a team of 40 to, to create the content. Abandoned ship! Make for the escape pod! Right around the time of when we were working on Cataclysm content, the opportunity came up to work on something a little bit outside of our comfort zone. We had just finished working on uh, StarCraft II uh, Wings of Liberty campaign, and we had made a whole lot of movies that played back in real time in the game engine. And as we were talking to the, the WoW Machinima team, and finding out how they were working, a lot of the stuff that they were doing, they were kind of writing these, these one-off scratch tools. So I figured, why not try to take this tool set that we have, this pipeline that we have for StarCraft, and see if it'll work for a game that's completely outside of our scope entirely. Don't come any closer. You probably ran until you couldn't take another step. I remember that feeling. We were just about to roll into production on Heart of the Swarm, and we had written a new pipeline, and we did not know if this was gonna work. Then all of a sudden, we find out this machinima team is gonna be doing a project for uh, Diablo, and we thought, oh, what a perfect opportunity. We could take the WoW Machinima team combined with our StarCraft II pipeline, uh, marry the two with a story for Diablo III, and come up with something new. We're going to die here, aren't we? No. As long as I'm here, they are the prey. And I am the hunter. <laughs> So we used the Star 2 engine for rendering. We used the Diablo team to make the assets. And then Machinima, we kind of pulled from that really fast shoot from the hip Machinima culture to get a piece out the door in the really close time frame that we had. The fundamental pipeline that we use today is the same pipeline that was developed prior to the Demon Hunter piece. I think that was when we put our eyes on the prize as far as this is where we need to be going. Early 
on, we would identify the, the big story arc that we want to tell, like what we think the key moments are. And we kind of block out those key moments and, uh, and, and sort of describe to them the action leading up to it. Hmm. A message must lie within. Dave had a lot of great ideas right out of the gate as far as, you know, dude, we could, we could tell this story, and we could tell this story, and we could tell this story. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool, you know, just, just let me know where, and we'll point our gun, and we'll, we'll make it happen. When we see in the movie the exact repercussions of whatever the player has done really feels validating, like a reward. Um, and that's what we wanted to go with, with, uh, say, the Jade Temple scene, where we see the devastation and, and, the, uh, and the repercussions of bringing our fight to Pandaria. The control over animation, the control over effects, the control over cameras is so tight and so specific that it feels like a real rendering engine that uh, you would spend millions of dollars on. Enough! You have run rampant for far too long, Hell Scream. But that stops now. Coming to the end of the Mist of Pandaria experience, uh, we knew that the final patch was coming down the line, and we had a long legacy of big final patches, whether it was Fall of the Lich King or Deathwing, or, you know, we have a, a big grandiose stage set before us, and we knew that uh, we were up for a challenge. So uh, we have Garrosh, who's learned a lot of lessons from Pandaria. He's come back, he's brought weapons of war, he's brought uh, Mogu technology that he's been using. And uh, most importantly, he's brought back the, the heart of Yasaraj. He's brought back the heart of this old god that been, had been buried under Pandaria for, for thousands and thousands of years. Mm, it thirsts. Bring it to the pools. Hunter Grant really gravitated toward the performance of these characters. He wanted Garrosh to feel very intimidating, very, very lively in a way that we really hadn't been able to achieve up until now when we didn't have dedicated animation support full time. You confront a force beyond reckoning. Your father dabbled in powers beyond reckoning. Where is he now? When Taryn started the project, first thing I told him is I said, remember your medium, it's animation, that you can do anything you want. Physics don't matter. And he took that to heart and went crazy with it. And when we got the boards back from all his ideas, it was a huge leap forward from, where we, from what we ever did before. I have fought beside the Tauren, trolls, and others. You are nothing like them! He seemed to want sort of the spaghetti western kind of almost Quentin Tarantino thing kind of going on, right? And so he needed really expressive faces. So you had this thing where the IGC team and the Machinima team are working together for the first time in a really close manner, trying to solve these problems and trying to get a really beautiful look. In 2014, World of Warcraft turned 10 years old. I can't think of very many PC games that are still on my hard drive after 10 years. Uh, keeping that up to date, keeping the game fresh requires a lot of things. There are absolutely things we would like to see come out of Machinima, you know? The dream of, hey, could I also get my character in that scene somehow? Is there some magic or sorcery we can work? Whether or not we ever solve that issue, it takes it to that next level. What if we look at the whole expansion as one story and that the cinematics were placed exactly at the turns of the big events. I mean, just universal story design. We're almost programmed to expect it, whether or not we're aware of it or not, and can we deliver on that? And then because we have Alliance and Horde, and that the stories are very different, but kind of mirror each other, kind of splinter off here, and each one of them have their own act one turn. You know, where events happen that put things in motion or change their idea about where they're going and what they're doing. And when you achieve that and you see the net result and you see the exclamation point of your deeds, 
that it feels like a complete experience. This is cool, right? I'm really digging where we as a team are going. We've been developing new tools for the cinematics team, uh, new ways of telling these stories, and we're seeing huge results. Uh, we saw it in Mists. We were playing with it in, in Warlords of Draenor, and the future's gonna look really good, I think. Establishing the look of our in-game cutscenes for World of Warcraft has been a long, long-standing process. Uh, we've gone through a lot of different stages in our capabilities of what we've been able to do. We feel like we've really leveled up in bringing more talented artists and lighters to be able to harness more cinematic techniques. And it's a very interesting, very rich opportunity to do a whole lot of storytelling. Picking where an expansion takes place is one of the most important decisions of the expansion. One thing I really like about the World of Warcraft franchise is that we can always kind of explore a lot of different territory. And we iterated through a lot of different locations. We thought about a lot of different settings that we could try. We thought about doing it in present day Outland uh, and adding new land masses, doing it on Azeroth. We thought of all kinds of variants. And one idea we kept coming back to was doing it on uh, Draenor, as it was, you know, 30 years ago. What excites me the most about Draenor is that it allows us as designers, as developers, to answer the unanswered, the, the questions that Outland left uh, in, in the minds of players. When you played through Outland previously, you got to see a lot of what happened to Draenor uh, after the Burning Legion came to it, after they tore it apart. But there's fantasies that have existed there for a long time that we've seen played out in the RTSs previously of the old orc clans in their prime. It's this very important place in Warcraft lore that we haven't really seen in game. It's not like Azeroth where there's kingdoms upon kingdoms upon kingdoms for thousands of years back. It's so important. It's where the ogres come from. It's where the orcs came from. It's where the Draenei had a, a, a civilization. It's something that you really haven't seen in game yet. This is a primal land, a land of giants. It's not a tamed world. It's a savage world. And that's the kind of place where you can have really exciting heroic adventures. I think the biggest thing about Draenor that's exciting to me is the fact that we get to see the original orc clans. I think it's something that people have questioned the whole time they've been playing WoW. We've always seen little tidbits of maybe the Frostwolf clan could have been like this, like with Thrall and things like that, but we've never got to see where do they live? What was their life like? And I think that's really the most exciting aspect to explore and then kind of integrating that into the gameplay across the whole game. What excites me more than anything else about Draenor is being able to go back and see these orc civilizations as they were before all went to hell with the first and second wars. The orcs are kind of a big part of the heart and soul of what Warcraft is. And now we actually get to see them in their native form and see these distinct orc clans. It's time for us to go back to a primal Warcraft and the orc theme with Draenor really helps represent that. It's an orcs versus Azeroth, orcs versus humans. It's that orc invasion that started it all across the dark portal and we're doing it again, but on a massive scale. It's really nice to get back to something that really feels like it's the core of Warcraft it's hard to imagine something more core than getting to see, you know, really epic characters. You get to interact with some of the most notable characters in Warcraft history. Gul'dan, Ner'zhul, who, you know, of course, in Warcraft lore eventually becomes the Lich King. Durotan, Gromash Hellscream, a lot of these guys that, you know, unless you played some of the early RTSs, you've really never gotten to experience at all. So when it comes to the questing, actually being able to represent um, those orc hordes uh, and and, and see them with all their, their biggest, baddest leaders in their prime, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's something players, I think, have wanted for a really long time. It's something we're really excited to show. The other thing that's really cool is just the fact that we get to go back to a place that we've been to before, but see everything that was there originally. That we're going back to a pristine world before Burning Crusade, so we can reimagine this other world outside of Azeroth before anything happened. We can 
look at Karabor and see what that looked. Look at Taladar and see how that went. Uh, it gives us a chance to revisit these worlds in a totally new way. There's a mystery there. There's a story to be told that we left unanswered with Outland. And I feel like this is our chance to show the world what this planet was whole. I think you'll know in the first few minutes of gameplay what sets this apart. It's going to look better. It's going to look like nothing we've done before. This is completely reimagined world. It's outside of Azeroth, so almost anything goes. I want people to be awestruck by the environments because every new expansion is a new opportunity to push the limits of our game. The original idea from Garrison's came from actually the farm in Pandaria is really kind of the seed of what set it for us. The farm was a unique thing in Pandaria where you could kind of not exactly own that place, but I think a lot of people considered it theirs. It became very popular. And we, we kind of saw that attachment people were having and our, our thought was generally, how can we expand upon that? How can we take that and turn it into something that feels Warcraft? When we think about housing and traditional MMOs, a lot of times we think about these instanced off places that aren't really part of the world or we think about places that don't really have a lot of gameplay associated with them and those were things that we felt like didn't feel right for world of warcraft as we continued to iterate on this idea we came to this conclusion that what would feel more like housing for world of warcraft than the idea of building a warcraft base and having it perform similar functions but inside world of warcraft garrisons is a feature that has me extremely excited about the expansion. I feel like as we are integrating our world into Garrisons and Garrisons back out into the world, we're actually seeing the metagame, the play style of even normal questing changing. Right from an early point in your experience with Warlords of Draenor, you're gonna be introduced to the place where you're going to be able to found your Garrison location. And once you really lay down those roots, you're going to be able to quickly start building buildings and collecting followers that are really going to help you through the entire level up experience and also in the end game. The concept here was to not just create something that looked pretty and felt like, um, like your traditional housing. We wanted to do something that would give WoW itself a fresh spin. Historically, we've always kind of had a capital city. You know, you log in, you log out at your capital city. We really want the garrison to feel like that place. You can really claim it as your own. We didn't want it to feel like, oh, I built this building and it just looks really pretty. The goal was, what does that building do for me? Does that building give me a bonus somewhere in the world? Does that building um, give me a bonus somewhere in my garrison? It's very customizable. You're gonna be able to pick uh, what buildings you want, where those buildings go. You get to pick specializations for those buildings, which will give them like individual abilities. So it's kind of neat because every garrison will feel a little bit different, right? Not everyone's gonna have the exact same thing. When we first started to uh, come up with the garrisons, we uh, wanted to take the player kind of down memory lane. So we did look at some of the original WoW structures. But when we started working on it and infusing that, we realized we couldn't just give the player uh, an older asset with a new coat of paint. So we started tweaking it, looking at the silhouettes and um, adjusting the design so that we can infuse something newer into those assets. For the, the human alliance structures, we looked at old castles and old English structures. And for the Horde, and they're just their own unique design and style. Garrisons is a very large undertaking, and it naturally, as a result, you'd expect to find there's going to be a few places where there's just challenges we didn't expect. Um, a lot of the personal housing implementations you've seen before, uh, you end up feeling crowded, or you don't end up feeling like there's something special, and we don't want to do that. We're World of Warcraft. We make awesome stuff. So we introduced some new technologies. Um, we call it seamless instancing. We'd experimented with it before, but here is where it really starting to shine. The seamless instancing is born out of the same technology that we used in Mr. Pandaria to bring cross-realm zones. Typically, when you go to an instance, you're at some location in the game world, and we need to send you to another location in the game world. In order to do that, we need to load all of that data that's going to be in the instance, and we need to get rid of all the data that you had with you. One of the things we're really excited about for Warlords of Draenor is when you ride up to your garrison, 
you're gonna do it without a loading screen, even though you're actually going into instance content, which you're used to seeing when you go into a dungeon. As you move through the worlds, once you get closer to your garrison, you'll be able to see your garrison from afar. But once you get to the garrison, we spin up a server instance, you go there, and then you're basically playing on your own server. All of the garrisons exist on the same piece of real estate in the game world on Draenor, even though everyone is going to be able to see their own version of that garrison. How this works is whoever is the party leader at the time is going to have their garrison appear to everybody in the party. If you want to change which garrison you see, you can change the party leader and watch that silhouette of the garrison change. One of the really neat things about going into your friend's garrison is seeing the different choices they made in either recruiting companions to go on missions for them or to see the choices that they made about which buildings to upgrade and even where to put them. The whole concept of the garrison is that you get to pick what you're doing along the way. So you get to pick, you know, what buildings do I want because each building has a different bonus. We have this concept of monuments. So when you earn achievements throughout the game, certain achievements will let you unlock a monument in your garrison. Say you've defeated all the hardest raid bosses in the game, you know, we'll give you a huge statue in the garrison that shows that. You can invite your friends over, they can check it out. So it's not only something that's just for you, it's also going to feel like a social place. So our follower system is a chance for players to find really awesome characters that they meet in a world and get to bring them back and utilize them to send them on missions. There are a lot of different things that we want to do with followers. We'd like followers to be involved both in the defense of your garrison when things attack your garrison and really fulfill that military fantasy. But also we have an entire mission system where you can level up your followers, you can get them gear, you can give them additional abilities and traits and these help them get even better on the missions. You can name them, you can set up their abilities, and you really try to mix and match to get guys that feel right. So aside from the world building kind of side of it, we've also got this great almost little mini game that you can run using the followers and the missions. When you log in and go to your garrison, you're gonna have a list of a bunch of different missions that have showed up that are things like going out and fighting the horde in a particular area or rescuing a Draenei town or anything else across Draenor. You'll be able to send your followers off on these missions, and in some cases, they'll be extensions of the things that you've done out in the world. In some cases, they'll be extensions of the followers' own quest lines and their own desires. And in other cases, it's sort of simple military stuff where you're patrolling around, you're assaulting, you're sieging, you're doing a lot of things as this garrison commander, like you would as a commander in Warcraft 3, without your player actually needing to go out there. You can kind of have that feeling of, this is my crack squad of guys, and I get to send them on missions, and they bring me loot, and I think that's fun. Before you may have quested for that awesome green or blue item, now it, the stakes are higher. Now you're actually doing things in the world to advance your garrison, and your garrison is what's going to help you win this war against the Iron Horde. It gives you an awesome opportunity for offline progression. Whenever you're not online, things can be happening. You can be progressing your trade skills, you can be progressing your character. And in a number of ways, we want to make it so that this accommodates the player that only wants to log in once for a number of hours every couple of days, and also the player that wants to stay online all the time. We're doing a brand new AI tech in this expansion. It's really cool. It's called the Brain AI, and it's a very needs-based AI. So what we'll do is we'll create a character, say he's a blacksmith, and he has certain needs. The blacksmith really, really likes being at the anvil working. So he goes to the anvil and works, but every now and then he gets hungry. So he gets up and walks over to the inn and has a beer. He needs to eat, he needs to talk, he needs to socialize, but all these needs are different weights. And then he gets tired, so he goes and takes a rest, and then he's like, oh, I need to work again. So he gets up and goes back to work. It's a way for us to sort of control our AI without having to do advanced scripting and take up a lot of developers' time in writing all these things. It feels like a town. It feels like a city. It, it, it feels vibrant, alive, and active. Leveling up is something that you're going to do, of course, as a player character in terms of gaining your, your levels all the way up to level 100, but it's also something that your garrison's going to do. The garrison itself grows bigger. Its walls actually expand, and all the art changes each time to kind of show how it's getting more epic and more epic each time you do it. And you're going to want to do those upgrades because that's the main way that you can build buildings that affect those missions that you're running, and those missions are going to be generating loot for you. The biggest challenge, I think, with Garrisons was just how massive the feature is. There are so many moving parts with it. A lot of times with a UI design feature, uh, the designers will have an idea of what they want to do, and they'll come to us like, we want to do this feature, how do we make this happen? We really wanted to take inspiration from Hearthstone and really give it a visceral feel because uh, for a large portion of it, it's all in the UI. There's the building UI, which is, you know, placing your building and, you know, sort of making your mark with your, your fort. And then there's the mission UI, which has so many moving parts with different followers, and it all interlocks in a massive way. 
we're really hoping that it's just an exciting thing to come back to WoW, check in on your garrison, and we really want to bring to life your followers. Really, the entire team came together to create the garrisons. Every single different aspect of game design, whether it's level design or the quests, uh, the encounter team. It's something that we need engineering support from, a massive amount of art support. Um, we're working very closely with the quest team to make sure that the quests feel integrated. There's a lot of engineering work that goes into it. We need to be able to deal with it from a server load perspective. The UI uh, engineers and designers played a huge role in that, of course. A lot of coordinating between design and art. There's AI brain technology that we're doing. The engineers set the foundation for the seamless instancing that we have. It really is a feature that is touching every core part of the team. It fits the story really well. We come through, we establish a base, we grow that base, the base gets stronger, and eventually we overthrow the Iron Horde using that base. I don't think there's any way the player could feel more involved in the storyline. WoW is a game that has increasingly gotten better from a uh, artistic standpoint. Our engine's gotten better. We've been able to support more things environmentally. But in 10 years, we have yet to do anything with the character models. The biggest challenge we faced with uprising the characters is probably just the metric ton of work that it is to actually do it. I think it just became daunting. It's why we've been talking about it for so many years. You know, we've mentioned it's something we really wanted to do but we also didn't want to overpromise and underdeliver on it. If we were just making these from scratch, as in, you know, make a new game and just make these character models and put them in, we're done. And I think a lot of people think that is kind of how it is, uh, but there's definitely a lot more to it than that. The goal behind changing the character models was to upgrade the quality level of those models to reach the fidelity that we have in the rest of the game today. The quality of the environments of the game have really gone up over time with each expansion. You know, we're at the point now where if you put assets that we create now up against the ones that we had 10 years ago, they look pretty dramatically different in terms of just the quality. While the style is very similar, uh, the quality's gone up quite a bit. The number one goal with the model updates was to really keep the spirit of the original character models. And I think it's, it's sometimes hard for people to understand what that means, because they just want to see, you know, high-res art, better textures, more polygons. And yes, that's a big part of it. But the other part of it is to make sure when you log in and you're looking at your brand new Torin, that that Torin still feels just like the Torin you might have played for these last, you know, nine years. The new models were a challenge. We reviewed the old models, compared them with the new ones, and we wanted to uh, retain what existed on the old animations. We didn't want to stray away from that, so we really worked hard on keeping the personality and the spirit that the, the old animations had. It's very important that we don't separate the player that this new model feels like something totally different. We want it to feel awesome, for sure, but we still want it to have the dance that you love, the same animations you love. All those little things that make it feel like your character was very important to keep those during the upgrade process. We're trying to do what probably no other MMO has really pulled off successfully in that we want to create a new set of character models that really retain the soul of the original. And some of that is through animation. In fact, a lot of it is through animation. The characters need to move the same way. They need to express themselves in very similar kinds of ways. If you think of character development as uh, building a marionette, the modeler would carve the pieces out of wood. The texture artist would probably paint the pieces. The rigger would use little wiring and little strings to create a marionette out of it. And then the animator would pull the strings to make the marionette dance. This probably started back when we redid Thrall in Cataclysm. We needed to give him a lot more emotion than the previous iterations. That eventually led us to do the panda, which then was able to do all these other emotive things. We kind of set a standard with the Pandaren for Mr. Pandaria, and we wanted to bring that to all the classic races. Ringing the face was a problem. It was a big one because even though we have a full set of animators, they couldn't potentially be animating the same things over and over again. So we needed a rig that knew what a smile meant for, say, the Toran and the human, even though they're completely different. And so when the animator dialed up the smile, 
they would both smile, one right for the Tauren, one right for the human. With the new models, we obviously have a much higher poly count now than we did in the past. So because we had hundreds of polygons uh, in the old models, and now we have thousands of polygons, we really needed to kind of up our game with the rigs. Upping that poly count is like tremendous. It does so much. All the hairs have way increased poly counts. The, the skeletons for animation have way more bones. Because you have this higher poly count, you now have to drive deformations that need to look a lot better than they used to because you had fewer polygons. So these new rigs have a lot of great extra controls that we can kind of use to our advantage. You know, we're able to achieve expressions now, which we really weren't able to in the old versions of WoW. The old animations didn't pour exactly one-to-one -to, -one to the new models because the new models uh, have way more interactive hairstyles. The dwarf male's beard used to be skinned in with the rest of his spine. So when you would rotate him, his beard would kind of stay with him. But now we have like a fully functional beard. I don't think we realized originally, we thought, oh, we just go in and, and up res these guys and we'll do each one. But then you start to look at each animation doesn't work anymore because now that we've added braids of hair to the beards, they need bones. Those bones need to be animated and they need to be animated for every single animation that character has. One of the big things that we talk about is bones or joints. And what that means is how many articulation points exist in the body. We have in the human body over 200 bones. In Thrall, we had somewhere like 60 to 70 bones, which is roughly about 65 to 67 articulation points. In the panda, we had 160 bones, which means about that many articulation points. So if you think of the body not having enough articulation points, you get a little robotic, which is what happens to Thrall. But the panda gets a lot more fluid because he has all those places where he can articulate. All of our characters are rigged with joints, and those joints are children of each other. Every sequential joint is parented to the joint before it. Instead of moving one controller, you move several controllers to get kind of a smoother curve. We had to be able to optimize the engine to the point where they're able to, to actually deal with everybody being at the same fidelity level that we had for the Pandarans. There's like facial animation that happens. There's an insane amount of triangles and bones for a game like WoW, and that takes a lot of work to be able to deal with that on the engine side. We really felt like it was time. The world needed this. Uh, our fans needed this. We've wanted to do this for a while, but this is the time to do it. I think right now what you're seeing is us finally getting to that point where we're able to get everything done, deliver on those promises, and give people those updated models they've been looking for. It feels like we're making a new game, which is awesome. It's a big challenge to uh, overhaul all of these characters, but I think everyone's gonna be really happy. They, they look really great.
Times change.
Pandaria, her hills of gold, in dark and mournful times of old, did once a hopeless horror hold. When from her sacred veil did spring, with storm and flash, a monstrous thing, his name, Lei Shen, the Thunder King. His thunder boomed across the land, and none who dared and fought could stand against the Iron Tyrant's hand. A palace grand, a warm domain, such mighty works born of his reign, built by slaves, their hearts in chains. But seasons change and tyrants die, his fury spent in times gone by. The thunder slept beneath Kunlai. Secure the remains, brothers. By Zandalari hands, he has been taken. By Zandalari voice, he has awakened. the pools. Enough! You have run rampant for far too long, Hell Scream. But that stops now. <laughs> Step aside, Pandar. You confront a force beyond reckoning. Your father dabbled in powers beyond reckoning. Where is he now? <laughs> Counting on it. 
the armies of the world will come for me. And within my fortress, they will face all the terrible creatures I have wrought. The boundless power I have mastered. And one by one, they will fall at my feet. Anyone who would rise against my new horde will be impaled upon the spires of Orgrimmar! You, Pandaren, tried to bury your hate and your anger, but such power cannot be contained. It must be unleashed! A time will come when you will answer for your crimes. I answer to no one! in return everything
です。